Well, thank you, Norm, and uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to be continuing where I left off in Chicago. You remember in Chicago, my talk, ICCC7, was specifically about how to bring the left, people who have different worldviews to the majority of climate skeptics, how to bring them over to a more realistic perspective of climate change. And my talk is going to actually continue right from this. Get this working here. Forward. Press green. <laughs> How do you make it go forward? I'm pressing green right. Ah, there we go. Okay, I guess it's connected now. So the objective of my previous talk was to talk about the impact of cultural and social worldview on how people react to controversial issues. Unfortunately, it's not just the facts that convince them. Okay, there are many other aspects that have to do with the actual hard wiring and soft wiring, you know, the software you learn during your life of your brain. And I was proposing how you reach consensus on really complex issues that traditionally the left and the right bash each other on. Today I'm going to continue on that and talk about some solutions to that particular problem. And the problem of switching slides seems to be one that I have right now. Okay. <laughs> Maybe I'll just say next if I can't get it to go on its own. Okay, so I'm going to be covering uh, several things here. First of all, why it's important to bring in centrists and the left, okay? Right now, as you'll see, it's a trench warfare. It's like the middle of World War I, okay? Everybody's dug in. They're bashing each other. Nobody's moving more than a few feet. Lots of people are dying. If you're going to win a war like that, you're going to have to start. You need a new weapon, and I'm going to be exposing a new weapon, I think, that is a tank that will roll right over the other tr and actually get people to defect sides. We're going to talk about obvious strategies, okay, things that people are already doing to help bring over the left. We're going to talk about less obvious strategies, but finally, the most important thing, unrecognized, but in my opinion, the most important strategies. And these will actually answer the question that I asked at the beginning of my presentation, are left-wing intellectuals the people who will finally kill the climate scare? That sounds surprising at first glance, but think about it. Traditionally, the left are the skeptics. Okay, they're always criticizing the right for being absolute, you know, fundamentalist, things like that. The left were the ones who recognized and welcomed Albert Einstein's relativity. And of course, the right were opposed to it because they thought it threatened their absolute traditional values and their worldview. So in the climate area, things have for some reason turned upside down. Philosophers who would normally be very skeptical of absolute statements are now actually staying mute. They're not saying anything. We're going to talk about why that is the case and maybe we can engage these people and actually bring them in to say, come on guys, this is very uncertain science. You don't know what you say you know. <laughs> so we'll get on to that. But first of all, let's talk about the obvious strategies. And I'm clicking my button here. Here we go. Now, the, the real problem, of course, as I described last, last time in, in Chicago in 2012, is that the people on the left who are egalitarian communitarians, okay? There are people down here. These are people on the left. Unfortunately, on the right of this diagram, they are much more alarmed than the people on the right who are generally hierarchical individualists, okay? Now, last time, I went through why that is the case. And that is exactly what we see. Now, that wouldn't be so much of a problem if the vast majority of the country were hierarchical individualists. But, as I'll show you in a minute, that's not the case at all. Here's what, in fact, the United States looks like according to a re recent poll. They showed that 34% generally are left-wing, liberals, Democrats. 41% are Republican. That doesn't sound too bad if you're a Republican until you dissect the uncertain, okay, the purple. Let's dissect the purple and see how it actually looks, how people are actually uh, coming about in their political positions. And I'm still not changing. So what I'll, there we go. Okay, so what I'll do, I think, from now on, instead of playing with this, I'll just say next, okay? Is that fine? Yeah, because otherwise we're going to be going 20-minute talk trying to do it all. <laughs> now, here's the trouble. With the undecided, there is a distinct advantage of the people who lean liberal, okay? They are not fully liberal in their self-identification, but they clearly are liberal. And so, next, as a consequence, you end up with this as the overall U.S. balance. The U.S. slightly leans left. So it's a real problem if you're trying to win the war when the left are primarily climate alarmists, okay, or people who believe the dangerous anthropogenic climate change scare. And it's not just the, uh, it's not just the general public. Um, people talk about the blogosphere as being a great place for democratic discussion and the opportunity for us to get our word out. Well, it is true that in uh, sole authored blogs, things like Anthony Watts's, 
we do actually have a majority. The right wing actually are in the majority of that kind of blog. But unfortunately, every other type of blog, fundraising blog, calls to action, uh, in-depth analysis, uh, large-scale collaboration, they are all overwhelmingly left wing, okay? And that is, is a real problem. If you don't have those people on your side, you've got an enormous blogosphere against you. And of course, most of mainstream media, and depends on which surveys you look at as to what the distribution is, but most mainstream media are generally left of center. One of the scariest things to see is the enormous change in academia, okay? Back in 1984, as we can see here, about 39% of, next slide please, uh, next. <laughs> there we go, I guess I forgot to say that, didn't I? Uh, that previous one was showing you the distribution of the, um, in the blogosphere. You can see that in 1984, 39% of university professors aligned themselves with the left. Only 15 years later, it was 72%, okay? And that's the most recent statistics that have been a good survey. There have been other surveys, but, but not really good ones. This one had a massive number of scientists, 1,600 professors, hundreds of universities that were looked at. So these are the latest good statistics. Uh, the total right has dropped from 34% to 15%. And the scary thing is there's been a tripling, a tripling of academics who are far left. Okay, so we've gone from a practical parity, just about even left and right in our universities, to now a five to one ratio, or more, because it's gotten worse, I'm sure, since the last good poll, a five to one ratio of academic professors who are left to right wing. So if you're not convincing those people, <laughs> you've got big problems. Okay, so the real question, next please. The real question is how do we bring centrists and the left over to climate realism? Well, obviously, like I said last time, we have to use strategies and spokespeople that appeal to centrist, next, uh, left-wing views and philosophies. Next slide. I'll give it a shot with this, okay, because <laughs> I'm not used to telling people next. And there are some obvious strategies. Next. First of all is to avoid insults. Now, I know a lot of people here don't like Al Gore, and they disagree with him, and they think he's, well, I will fill in the blank, you know. <laughs> they don't like him. But millions of Americans and many people around the world have a lot of respect for Al Gore. He almost became president. He won Nobel Prize. Whether he deserved it or not is another question. But you don't bring people over to your point of view by beating up their hero, okay? That's just going to entrench the world war even tighter. So it's, it's fine, like Steve McIntyre said in the very first ICCC one, it's, it's enough to show they're wrong, okay? Because insults, next slide, can lead to all kinds of problems, okay? It's enough to see that there's enormous difference between the left and the right. We don't need things like this. If you can read this, then you're a liberal elitist. Or if you can read this, then you're not Sarah Palin, <laughs> okay? So there's enough difference between the left and the right without them actually physically hating each other which, of course, a lot of the rhetoric does, you know, libtards and things like that. Uh, and, and, you know, I think that in many issues we have to be you know, not classified, be sensible, you know, left on some things, right on others. You know, that's what my dad says. He's 93, and you'd think he was a conservative until you see him out skinny dipping, <laughs> you know. So the bottom line is uh, he's sensible, and I think that's what we're trying to explain to people. You don't have to change your intellectual affiliations to be sensible on climate change. Okay, and that's what I'm trying to show you is how to convince these people to be sensible. Next slide. So the next uh, strategy would be to help people understand that a better use of money, instead of worrying about what might happen in the year 2050, is to help people today. And Kille, Mo um, Kille Moore's uh, rap video last night showed very clearly, think of all the amazing things we could do on, and get this, it's $1 billion a day that is going into climate finance around the world, okay? And we'll talk about that in a couple of slides. But the bottom line is there are so many good things you can do with this kind of money to help people, and people from across the political spectrum. It, it's really hard to argue that you should let Africans die due to lack of fresh drinking water because we're trying to stop what might happen in the year 2080. You know, that is a hard argument to make. Next slide. This is what Benny Pizer from the Global Warming Policy Institute does. Very sensible. He's saying for poor people especially, if you bring in these draconian climate rules, you're going to end up with a choice for poor people between eating or heating. And you can watch his presentation on this slide. You can't see it on the screen, but at the bottom of my slide, when they actually show it on the web, you can watch his presentation. So those are obvious strategies, okay? They're things that we should obviously always do, and they are good for expanding the tent of climate realism. Next slide. Next slide. Now, appeal to their worldview. Next slide. 
The Climate Policy Initiative uh, report in October 2013, they found that when they did a worldwide analysis for the year 2012, that approximately $1 billion every day was being spent in the world on climate finance. Now, the next slide. They actually did something quite interesting with that information. Here we go. There we go. They analyzed how much of it was being spent on today's problems, in other words, helping people adapt to real climate change, no matter how it's caused, uh, in comparison with trying to mitigate or stop what might happen in the distant future. And here's what they found out. They found out that 94% of all the billion dollars a day is going to try to stop what might happen in the distant future. Only 6% is going to help people now. And when I was at the Copenhagen Climate Conference, one of the Ethiopian delegates said, he said, ah, he said they're giving more value to the lives of people who haven't been born than people who are suffering in my country right now. You know, so I mean, this is an argument that the left have a very hard time answering. Are you going to let five million Africans die every year due to bad drinking water, diseases that are caused by that? Or are you going to worry about what might happen in the year 2080? You know, it just really doesn't make any sense. Next slide. The Perhaps, though, the most powerful argument is the one that I'm going to actually direct you to learn more on your, on your own about, because I'm, I'm uh, running out of time, and that's the use of philosophy, okay, and the philosophy and history of science to help bring over leftists. You have to remember that about 81% of university philosophy professors are actually on the left of the political spectrum. Next slide. And so we have to start out with a couple of definitions. First of all, knowledge, something we know. Plato and most philosophers have always treated knowledge as truth something that cannot be wrong. And, and a good jargon to remember is L UNC, which is universal, necessary, and certain, okay? The, the debate was always between Plato and the sophists. Next slide. As to what was true about nature. The sophists, they said that we could not know truth. That in fact, all we had were beliefs and opinions, just like Patrick Moore was saying, beliefs and opinions based on observation and experience. And all philosophers, ever since Plato, have recognized that observation and experience are very particular, they're contingent, and some degree of probability, okay? In other words, the very opposite of UNC. Now, to, in that, keeping that in mind, let's look at the very first sentence of the synthesis report from IR4. The IR5 one is not out till October. Here's what they say, and I'll just stop partway through because I think you'll start to laugh. <laughs> this is the first sentence in their most important document, okay? Warming of the climate system is unequivocal, as is now evident from observations. Okay, we're right back to a fundamental discussion between philosophers from hundreds of years ago. Observations are contingent, okay? They're probable. They are certainly not knowledge. They're not universal, necessary, and certain. And of course, scientists and philosophers, because remember, in the early days of science, they were called natural philosophers. Until about 1830, they were natural philosophers. They had a much broader scope. They not only looked at the science facts, but they looked at how it fit into different theories of knowledge. And in fact, theories of knowledge were developed to try to prove Newton's laws, which was a little bit funny. They took Newton's laws as gospel, then they developed theories of knowledge to prove his laws. But regardless, these were natural philosophers. So they would look at something like this and they say, something that's unequivocal cannot be demonstrated by something that is equivocal. That's uh, 12, eh? Okay, so uh, I just defined what equivocal was. And here's a def I'm going to show you something really interesting. From both sides of the spectrum, they say that a statement like this is ridiculous. Okay? This fellow, Professor Stephen Goldman, who teaches this really excellent course that I'll reference you later. It's a course on the philosophy of science. You can get it from The Great Courses. It's on my slide. Actually, you have a link. I've been watching this. It's called Science Wars, What Scientists Know and How They Know It. Okay, really worthwhile, super applicable to the climate debate. The thing that's most interesting about it is when you hear debates between Descartes and uh, Bacon, they're just like the debates nowadays between modelers and observation people. Okay, and you can listen and actually see how they debate each other and how they beat each other and how they lose. So it's very, very applicable. This professor, Stephen Goldman of Lehigh University, he does support the dangerous DAGW hypothesis. And he says that the UN statement is an attempt to persuade extra-logically. <laughs> In other words, kind of like extraterrestrial, it's outside of logic. 
Going even farther, David Wojcik, somebody who you know does not support the DAG hypothesis, he says, reasoning from evidence is inductive logic. And as for unequivocal, there's never been a case, this, that's never been the case in inductive logic. I won't analyze that statement anymore because I'm pretty near out of time. But the bottom line is also, you notice how they said it's proven by observations of average temperature sea level. Well, no, you don't make observations of average anything. You calculate them based on inductive reference, okay? It's data that you actually measure. So I'll just skip over. Obama's making these kinds of statements all the time. Here was his speech just a week ago that I wrote in the Washington Times. Look at how many times he said, uh, go forward three slides, please. He said, we know that all these things. One more. One more. One more. One more. Ah, okay. So President Obama, he's going around the world giving these speeches, telling us all the things we know. And a philosopher looking at that would say that's ridiculous. And next slide. There we go. We know, we know, we know, we know. Of course, we don't know those things. They're opinions and beliefs. And in his case, they're just what other people told him were their opinions and beliefs. Okay. Now, people might think this is kind of academic. Why should we try to reduce from certainty to probability? Well, it's a big, there's a really solid reason. If you were to plot how much, what fraction of the money on climate, and this is if you believe in the climate scare, what fraction of it should be spent on mitigation versus adaptation? If you knew there was a dangerous anthropogenic climate change uh, event happening in the year 2080, you might very well use today's proportion of money, the 94% to 6%. But as you just go into probable, okay, or maybe even less probable, it very rapidly drops. You don't want to spend all your money on the same thing. Okay, you want to basically put more money into adaptation. Now, I don't have time to go into this except to say that the theory of knowledge and the method of science was originated largely by people by Francis Bacon. Okay, he talked about how the mind really messes up how you understand science, and he developed his idols of the mind. Descartes said the exact opposite. So there were two scientific methods right there, and you can see how they fight each other back and forth, which in fact is a very good model and a good analogy of modelers versus observationists. So I just recommend that course once more. We'll skip ahead to that last slide, and if you want to learn more about it, and you really need to, because in fact this is going to become critical when the warming restarts, because at some point there will be a warming, and then we have to be able to defeat it right away. And if we can bring philosophers in and people who understand philosophy, they will just say, independent of the science, your statements are nonsense. Thanks a lot.